people have been asking me to talk more about, you know, where I get ideas from, uh, what influences me, and uh, how I got here, right? How I got to this point um, uh, in my career as a designer. Uh, and also just, you know, what, what am I thinking about when I'm, when I'm making art? All those things are, are related. Um, and I'm going to try, I'm going to try really hard to, I'm going to try to talk more about those things um, and try to make some sense of it all. You know, I think the easiest way for me is uh, just to talk, right? Stream of consciousness, um, not to try to overthink too much. All this stuff is combined, right? Like it's all mixed up. That's why it's, I guess for me, not so easy for it to all come out in a way that's organized and, and makes sense. I mean, there's a lot of different places where ideas come from, I guess. And we'll get through a lot of those, but one of the primary places that ideas come from are other other artists, right, and other art. But today, at least I'm going to start, I'm going to start by talking about Marshall, Marshall Arisman because um, he's on my mind. Marshall Arisman passed away. At least, I don't know if it was yesterday or today. I just found out today. And Marshall Arisman was and has had a profound, uh, absolutely profound effect on, on my art and my career. Uh, and probably just me as a person. So, I'm just going to talk about what I know, um, what I remember, what I, what I think I know. <laughs> about Marshall, or at least about his impact on my work. And I'm gonna work paint while we're, while we're talking and we'll just see what comes out. Over 20 years ago, I was working at a design agency in Atlanta called IXL. It's a great, great place. Lots of really cool artists, um, designers, people. Uh, it was a fun time. Um, and as part of that, that job, uh, you know, we would do training where we could go and go to different conferences, design conferences and stuff. And one of them was the HAL conference. And it uh, was here in Atlanta that year. And um, so a bunch of us went and, you know, you could pick which courses you wanted to take or which speakers you wanted to see or whatever. And uh, one of the speakers was Marshall Arisman. Now, uh, you know, there was a lot of design sessions right there was a lot of design sessions that day um and but there was one that stood out to me and it was it was uh this this illustrator um an artist marshall arisman and it was related to design but it was you know also definitely related to fine art and um so i, I was really interested in it and i went to see to see mr arisman speak and i had never heard of marshall arisman before and it was just an amazing, it was an amazing experience. Um, he's a great storyteller, first of all. Uh, he's very captivating. Uh, he was very captivating. Um, and his work was uh, amazing to me. Uh, it was just so different than anything I'd seen. He also had started out in graphic design. Um, I remember that and that he had sort of found his way into illustration. But it was clear that he had an interest in educating uh, people and, and young artists and designers and wanted to share his story and his path. And I was really taken with him. You know, I think, I think that he talked about how he was in a classroom with young kids and he talked about how these students just were free. You know, they, they, they didn't have the same inhibitions that uh, older people have, right? They... You know, this one kid was drawing, he showed a like, drawing of a, like a whale or a fish or something. And um, at the edge of the drawing, the, the, the kid had ran out of room. And instead of, you know, throwing the paper away and starting over, uh, they just kind of drew the tail going down, <laughs> like, turn, like a 90 degree turn. I, you know, it was really refreshing. There's something about that that was just like... I don't know. It's just it's just freeing, right? It was like, oh, you know, <laughs> we're too caught up in trying to be perfect or trying to plan out, I guess, what we're trying to do, and we're not as adults. We're we're encumbered, right? We're like, I took away from that that we were just we're sort of like, uh, 
um, blocked, right? We, we, we block ourselves. We, you know, I don't, I don't know how else to say it. You know, we, we basically, we, we get in our own way, right? So we have these ideas about how things should be, what they're supposed to be, and we're not free. And so that really stuck with me. Um, and I can't remember exactly everything he said. Uh, obviously it's been a long time, but I do remember that that image, and I do remember the general, you know, general perspective, general philosophy of, you know, it's we need to be more like those kids, right? We need to be more free and more childlike and more open to ideas and let kind of let things unfold and not try to predict too much where it should go or or let little things like the edge of the paper hold us back. You know, he, he told a lot of stories about his, his past, primarily um, the things that he was exposed to as a child. Well, the, the rural nature of, of where he grew up, uh, you know, cows and deer and deer hunting and guns. And yeah, so even, even though he was from upstate New York and uh, I was from very south Alabama and uh, he was over, older, of course, uh, there seem to be a lot in common and uh, a lot of parallels between sort of our upbringing and our experiences as kids. Um, you know, where we grew up was very similar. Um, also a lot of spiritualism. You know, he grew up in this town that apparently had uh, spiritualists. Like you had to be a spiritualist to own a home, I believe is kind of the way he put it. That's not exactly the same, but there was a lot of strong religious beliefs and beliefs in sort of the supernatural and the mysterious, the unknown, you know, all those things. Um, you know, strong faith, right? Strong faith and strong belief. So this mix of all those things was very uh, familiar to me. Like, very, very familiar to me. And so it was like all these things, right? Like, he, he, has, he was a graphic designer uh, before he decided to become a, a fine artist or went back to, to, to art. Um, you know, he... Um, grew up in this place that had all these familiar things uh, to me uh, and he was an artist and so like I don't know just all of that combined really uh, connected and resonated with me and something about this this way in which he had found you know and come full circle into his career you know he he started out in design and he hated it and he really struggled and you know went into details about why he found himself in that place and then what he did. And so, you know, he was trying to make his living as an illustrator, uh, but he was trying to go very trendy and just basically um, copying, right? What everybody else was doing, maybe what was popular or what he thought people would like. And he was struggling. He ended up making a list of, I think it was like four things. He made a list of four things, four things that he knew. So, I forget how he came to this conclusion, but he was like, I'm going to start to draw things I know. And he came up with this list of four things he wanted to focus on. And it was uh, deer, cows, the spirit world, and guns. And even, you know, to recently, he said that he's still drawing from and painting from just that, that list of four things. Now, these things have evolved, right? Like deer kind of melded into animals of other kinds and so did cows but and guns sort of turned into violence and, and spiritualism kind of got mixed in with all of it and the point is that he came up with these images that he would have never been able to access right he he would have never found his way into the type of art that he made if he would have stuck with following other people, copying what was out there without kind of going inside of himself and inside of himself and focusing on the things that he knew um, and kind of trusting that intuition um, and just working it to see see what would come. And you know, he ended up with these extremely violent, uh, raw, primal images that uh, sort of attracted the work to him, <laughs> right? So you had this body of work uh, that was scary, um, and it was dark, uh, and it was, and it was very personal, uh, and I forget exactly, you know, how, how, how it went down, but essentially there was an editor or an art director or someone who was, who needed a piece, 
who was writing a piece on violence um, or gun violence, maybe. And, and so they, they thought his work was perfect for that article. I think that's, that's kind of the way it went down. It's the way I remember it. Um, but the bottom line is that he started, you know, getting uh, his work published because it was um, perfect for the subject matter that existed and that, that there was a need for it. I think he ended up getting on the cover of Time magazine uh, definitely once, maybe more than once. He just had a passion and a love of, of art and the process and and with helping people. He also sort of acknowledges this this need to not let your conscious mind really drive the the bus, if you will. Like, you know, he's he starts to paint and he wants to get to this place where uh, he doesn't know where stuff is coming from, right? It's it's a subconscious sort of thing that it doesn't really have control over. I, and I don't think Marshall was saying that everyone had to paint that way, right? I don't think he was su suggesting that it was the right way t to do it. It was just his way of doing it. And I think, I feel like I can tap into that sometimes. You know, I feel like there are times where, um, you know, I, I like to make a mess and not think about, what's happening right just just kind of play around into intuitively and let something come out of that a lot of times it doesn't work you know he said the same um, a lot of times you know you just make a mess and it just nothing's really working and then it's literally like one one little move one little mark you know one little thing can change it all and all of a sudden there's something there and you know, he was a master at that. I think he was a master at kind of stumbling upon a visual and sort of having in his mind a, not an, out, not an outcome, but like a theme, right? Like a topic. Um, like he might have, he would do research, you know, and he would read histories of different people and cultures and he would have in his mind sort of this, this concept of, you know, like for instance, he did these spiritual cave paintings, and I, and I want to say that the the gist of that was like these drawings, like one over the other, sort of like created sort of this um, portal, the spiritual portal between realms, and so he would have those general concepts like in his mind, and then he would start to paint, and he would just let his subconscious uh, sort of drive and 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 lead the way, and. Um, I don't know. He just created these mystical, amazing, intuitive, raw, primal uh, works of art. As far as being influenced by Mr. Erisman, you know, I think that I will be influenced in the future probably even more so than I have been already uh, painting-wise um, because I've just kind of marinated on... <laughs> His, his perspective, his philosophy, his techniques, his style, all that stuff is in there. And some of it has come out in my work already, I know, but I think it'll happen more and more in the future as I just continue to work. But philosophically, his perspective on things have already influenced me and, and my career from a design perspective, without a doubt. So, you know, the story about the kid who drew the, 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 the fish or the whale and ran out of room on the paper and turned the tail down and just kept going. Um, it really resonated with me. It really stuck with me. And as I went through my career, um, I found myself, uh, you know, trusting my intu intuition, you know, trusting my intuition, um, not judging ideas, like trying to be open and sort of have this perspective that um, don't be too critical too soon, right? Don't give up too easy. If there's something that happens that is an obstacle, uh, work with it. Um, it. It helped me actually apply that from an art direction and creative direction perspective as well. Like having this more outsider perspective, outsider perspective on things, uh, you know, where... Um, I just saw other people's work differently, maybe, um, uh, certainly differently than, than I saw my own. Um, 
it just was like it just had a huge impact that that whole idea and concept of the way kids think and the way we approach um, creativity and art at a young age there's something really valuable about that approach and uh, I don't know again how to articulate it but I just feel it like I just feel it and I know that that had such a huge impact on me you know his his ideas about Drawing and painting what you know is something I've, I've seen and heard before. But it was a real-world example that was extremely, you know, clear and tangible, right? Like, a perfect example. This bird is driving me nuts. Uh, hold on. The story about how he got frustrated in his career and basically started focusing on you know, drawing something that he'd, he'd known his whole life but had never drawn before. And how that led him down this path, this creative journey, right? Exploring cows and deer and guns and violence and spiritualism. It really connected with me, right? And it was like, it's just like anything, right? Where when you try too hard and you do something that's inauthentic or fake or just not true to you, how it can lead you to, you know, down a wrong path or maybe um, to not the best results, right? And outcomes. And with, with this shift, with a shift in his approach where he focused on just doing something that he knew and, and something with meaning and something that was kind of from him, his whole career, right, changed from that that point on and whenever I have hard times in design um, or with art or with anything creative uh, I do find myself thinking about that and trying to kind of meditate on it and focus on maybe coming back closer to something that's more from my heart or from my soul and and also just this idea of like exploration and drawing and painting intuitively uh, where you don't really know the outcome. Um, that applies to design too. I think that throughout all these years where I've worked as a, as a designer but always wanted to be a painter, I still have found ways within my work to explore ideas and options with more of an open-minded approach where I just kind of let things unfold and see where it goes and don't throw any ideas away, right? Just have a very open-minded approach to it. And I think I think a lot of that is rooted in Mr. Erisman's speech and his approach to things and his his um his stories about and that philosophy of being open minded and, and letting the creative flow, like let the creativity kind of flow from from within. So I mean all of this is probably not exactly, you know, this is my interpretation of my experiences and my, my memories and the way I have um, taken stuff from, from him as far as lessons are concerned and changed them and made them my own. Um, so, you know, it's probably time for me to get a refresher. It's probably time for me to go back and look up some of the videos of him speaking and, and look at some of his work and, and do some writing and uh, try to reconnect to, to those things that uh, resonated with me so long ago. I'm going to miss him even though I don't know him, right? Um, never really met him. I just sat, sat in a room and listened to him talk. Um, but I followed his career um closely i studied his work and i still do um i watched a lot of his videos and everything i could find on the guy and um really appreciated you know what he what he brought um to the world to the world of art in particular and there's a ton more there um i would just encourage people that are interested um you know, if you if you know him, great. Uh, but if you don't, you know, if you, if you don't know who he is and you haven't seen his work, 
uh, go go check it out. You know, look, he's a dark guy. There's some darkness there, but there's some lightness too, right? And I think you need both. Um, obviously, without uh, one, the other doesn't exist. So, um, yeah, I would encourage people to go check out his work, um, especially if you're an artist, a young artist. Um, and uh, I think I think there's a lot to to learn. I know I think that I can't overstate how much his his work has influenced me and his thoughts have influenced me and yeah so let me know let me know if you've if you've seen his work before if you've um you know you know the man you you've been lucky enough to study under him or um have been influenced by him um, or someone else similar, uh, similar stories, um, or, uh, you know, if you have it, go check it out, go check it out and, uh, see what you can find or, or let me know, you know, if you're interested in hearing more about this or have a specific thought on it. Yeah. I'd love to discuss it with you, you know, so leave me a comment and, uh, yeah, thank, thanks for listening. Rest in peace, Marshall.